on bass guitar, we have the celebrated uh, Jeff Berlin, who's an American, highly trained bass player, who uh, has lots of technical facility, which means, in a word, that he can play what it is you want him to play. And we're doing our best to, to uh, put an English head on his American shoulders. Because uh, it's really nice if you can have an American's technical ability, but viewed through an Englishman's eyes. I think many of the American musicians tend to uh, look at music a little bit in boxes too much, which is a... Uh, not their fault, but the way the music business is set up here. On keyboards we have uh, Dave Stewart from l uh, lesser known English bands, but good English bands, National Health, Hatfield in the North, and Egg, another one before that. Mm -hmm. And Dave and I have been working as partners since 1975. I went to Dave and suggested, how about the idea of you, me and Jeff Berlin playing together? And he said, not really, because I'm just starting this group called National Health. But call me back in three years. So I called him back in three years, and uh, that's how we're together now. And on guitar we have the celebrated but unknown John Clark, who is a replacement for Alan Holdsworth, who didn't want to continue with the group, didn't want to tour particularly, and always likes to keep his back doors open so he can leave groups when they get too solid. He's more of a session man anyway. Yes, he is. Yeah, it's extremely hard. I mean, I, I had the benefit of his... Uh, ability for three albums, the UK one feels good to me and one of a kind. And he's a great player, but he's not he's not really a touring musician, you know, his talents are such that he'd rather pretty much stay in London and do studio work and things. He does he's not a good group musician. Because to be in a group you need other things apart from just playing ability. You need a certain robustness. That's be able to talk a lot. <laughs> mm -hmm. You need to want to tour around America, which a lot of people don't necessarily want to do. That kind of thing. So that apparently is what John Clark wants to do. So we're very happy to have him. And that's the quartet that uh, that we're touring the country with. Will Clark be staying with you for some time? Yes, or? yeah, as foreseeable future, sure. He's working very well, John. He's never been in a band before. Mm -hmm. He's never been out of England before. He uh, has no idea what the rock and roll business is all about. It's all a, an eye-opener to him. Neither has Jeff Berlin, for that matter, who's come from more from the jazz side mm -hmm. and studio side. So... Uh, it's quite educational, particularly for Dave, who's not been here, and mm -hmm. John and Jeff, although, as you know, I've been several times. What kind of reception have you received so far on your tour? <sighs> Very good. Hot yeah. and sticky. Uh, we've been playing smaller places deliberately, so that the enthusiasm is there, and, and there's definitely a buzz in the club that night, mostly two shows, and uh, we've been going very, very well. Surprisingly well. You see, we're surprising a lot of people. I mean, I don't, I, you may detect a slightly tired note in my voice here, but uh, I've been trying to tell people, don't worry, drummers are musicians too, drummers can lead bands, drummers can write material, drummers one day will even have gold records. Just don't worry about it. And there are a lot of business people and managers and record company people who are all surprised that we're doing so well. And I keep trying to tell you what I told you so. The audiences aren't surprised. I mean, they're going to like it anyway, mm -hmm. which is great. But the people who come in between myself and the audience are surprised that it's uh, as good as it is. To bring back, just go back for a second, with the uh, UK, I'm sure everybody is interested in what the difficulties were. Well, I, I can scarcely believe they are interested <laughs> in, in why musicians leave groups or why they join groups, but apparently they are still interested in these things. Uh, the difficulties were basically of philosophy and approach to audiences in general and on the one side of the fence you have the Wet and Jobson team of rock and rollers and they feel the best thing to do in music is try and figure out a marketplace for the music find out what it is that the young American boy wants then go away and design it and sell it to him on the other side of the fence you have Alan Holdsworth and myself who aren't quite so presumptuous as that and feel that really what musicians are, are supposed to do and are paid to do is their best and then they record that and they offer it for sale and if you don't like it that's fine if you like it that's also fine either way is fine mm -hmm. it doesn't matter much because the musicians are going to progress anyway irrespective of record sales so there's the, the, the there's the split in philosophy basically some people will call it rock and jazz you know but i prefer to think of it in terms of phil philosophy or ethics towards the paying customer mm -hmm. one is i think the uk method i think is somewhat patronizing is uh, dangerous in the extreme 
maybe maybe it'll work out. I hope so. They're spending a lot of money. Polaroid is spending a lot of money in the UK. Maybe they'll become the next DLP, which is presumably what they want, or maybe they won't. I feel that uh, they're cutting it a bit fine, and maybe America isn't that keen on uh, another DLP at this particular juncture. You know, we've got six months to 1980, right? And that was in 1973-4 that um, that was happening. It's a long time ago. So we had these discussions in UK, and I tried to convince Eddie and John of my uh, my doubts about that particular drift. They were obviously wanting to pull hard in that direction, whereas Alan and I, all all we seemed to be, was a break upon their obvious climb to platinum success. So uh, we were summarily dismissed, basically. And I could have argued with lawyers and all that about the name UK, but I mean, there's really no point. Because by this stage, I was very clear that uh, I wanted a group called Bruford, because I knew what to do with it. And uh, that's the position I'm in now. I remember last year, when you were here with UK, and I went to the party in which you and Sam Alter... Oh, yes. ...and Jerry Jaffe... Oh, yeah. ...all sitting there, and you were somewhat... Uh, not angry, but you were... You were uh, trying to state your views on what you thought the music should form, what it should evolve into, and yeah. they seemed to be more of into a commercial realm. Well, you have obviously understood the position exactly, my friend. <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, people invest money in these things. They want uh, a fast return on their investment, and as the country slips into a greater and greater recession, they want a quicker and quicker return on the investment. Consequently arty farty acts at the bottom of the record company roster get sacked unnecessary executives get sacked um, travel is tightened up budgets are slimmed the rich get richer and the poor get poorer which is what happens throughout industry in general and as I'm sure you know during a recession and music is and let nobody else kid you exactly the same as selling cornflakes or steel or anything else cars anything else same thing so if you have a new model like UK, you want it to make a very efficient return as quickly as possible on the money. I represented a threat to that, basically. I represented some kind of problem with that because uh, I'm not so keen to be too blatant about or too sure about what it is that American people want to hear. So consequently, I don't get the kind of treatment that UK does, which is understandable. Uh, I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not griping. You understand? I'm merely stating the case. This is all there is to it. I mean, it's totally factual. I don't think anybody from a record company would disagree with me. It is the way it is set up. You standardise the music. You have a kind of discotheque style of music, which is more or less standard. In times of recession, it's good to standardise the product so that there's no confusion in the marketplace. So a group like mine, Bruford, just is in some way a bit of a confusion in all this. Uh, radio stations don't play the kind of music I make because it doesn't have any singing on it. Therefore, it's co it's foreign music or ethnic music or it's classical music or it's jazz. Right. Because it's not rock, because rock has singing on it. Which, again, is small-minded thinking, which is why I'm doing a lot of talking like this to try and explain that there's nothing to be worried about and that some people, in fact, would like the music. And I know some people would like the music because I play to them every night and they go away well satisfied and they don't think is this jazz, rock, classical, progressive country, mm -hmm. or whatever. They're very pleased that the band has played, and they're extremely satisfied customers. But up at those shining record company offices, they'll have you believe those people don't exist. And of course, they don't really want to hear my music. They want to hear something else, which is dangerous corporate thinking. You know, it's the country of freedom, right? It's freedom is a, is a word often mm -hmm. used in the States. Often used in the States. And uh, when money gets tight, it becomes very, uh, very tight country, as it is for music right now. So we struggle on. I'm going to do it from a grassroots level, you see, as opposed to sort of from where UK are, which is semi-high, so touring with Jethro Tull and things um, on a fairly big budget. I'm going to come and play every club, and play it twice, and I talk to everybody personally and explain the case personally. And that's the only way I can do it because I'm not going to be allowed on anything national, really. Well, I imagine you're getting minimal airplay on commercial stations. Correct. And you're probably getting good airplay to heavy airplay on college radio stations. Correct. Now, what kind of audience do you actually have? Do you think even though there's a minimal airplay on commercial stations that you still have, let's say, uh, people that aren't college 
Oh yeah, people. There Certainly, people. yes. There's a lot, a lot larger audience than just the college audience. Um, how can I describe these people? They're they're just the young, the young rock and roll fans in every city. You know, I mean, we have ranging between a thousand and two thousand in every city in America. I mean, two thousand to three thousand in Philadelphia, two to three thousand in Los Angeles. In Los Angeles, we don't get played for love or money on the radio, but we're doing six sold out shows at the Roxy. Now those people are coming from somewhere, and they're not all coming from the University of California. You know, I mean, they're just they're just kids in the street. I mean, it's word of mouth type of thing. You know, that that, that we're worth we're worth it. We're worth a ticket at the Roxy. And eventually, up up at Polydor, they'll they'll see that this band, you know, that can do a thousand in Montreal, two thousand in Philly, three thousand in wherever. That that does represent some kind of support. So, do you predict a future change in music? I really hate predicting uh, anything in music. Actually, I think the only thing that you can safely predict is the inexorable change of fashion. So that what is fashionable today, you can safely predict, won't be fashionable tomorrow, mm-hmm. or be unfashionable tomorrow. So, whatever you have today, you won't have in a couple of years' time. Taking that one step broader, perhaps if it's very tight and very authoritarian regime today. Then it will swing probably to a looser one again, come 1982-3. Mm-hmm. And the advantage of people like me and the people like, and the musicians in this band is that they're actually stayers, because they're not very interested in fashion. They're more interested in music, mm-hmm. which means they're prepared to spend their life doing it. So unless you knock us off first, we're still going to be around. You see what I mean? I've been around for ten or eleven years. I prepared. To, I'm, I propose to go nowhere else. You know. I mean, I'm going to keep touring America. I'll be around. And I'm pretty sure, in fact, I know that stamina is what you need, almost more than anything. Just stamina to put up with this, uh, small difficulties like record companies and radio stations mm-hmm. in general. But there's no difficulty between the band and the audience. See, that's no problem. It's only the mediators between the two. The complications that Correct. evolve out of that. Correct. It's everybody ranging from the agents through to uh, record company people record management that th- those people see unnecessary problems like how come you're not returning the invest- investment quicker than ever you see they see unnecessary problems they make ulcers for themselves they get upset they get worried they they're always in a hurry whereas the band and the audience are doing fine i think it's tremendous that you're bringing in like dave stewart yeah he's a good man dave Good man, Dave. Are you bringing in, like, Dave Stewart? Yeah, he's a good man, Dave. Good man, Dave. And put out some tremendous music in his time. Yeah, he has done. He has done. It, it's not... It's not, um... I'm not doing it for, for fun, particularly. I mean, Dave and I happen to get on well together. Otherwise, we couldn't really be musical partners. You know, which we are. We're, we're hoping to become musical partners, and we're working on it. You know, mm-hmm. and of course, I've had some difficult times with musicians, so I, I don't like to say too. Cl- you know, to I don't want to state too obviously that we're going to be holding hands together in heaven in ten years' time. So far, we seem to have produced some quite fruitful stuff, and I'm sure we will do on our next album, which we'll record soon. Yeah, it's about time Dave came to America. You know, yes, most definitely. He's always wanted to come to America too. You know, but there's never been the support. Necessary to pay the air tickets, and well, now it looks like National Health might be touring then this uh, fall, and he's now out of National Health. He's out of National Health. He's trying to get them a tour this fall. I don't know whether he'll succeed or not, in the, given the current climate, but uh, hope so. Robin Lumley produced this second album, right, in conjunction mm-hmm. with many other people. No, he didn't. No, this second album, Robin didn't appear on the second album, one of a kind. He, I just used him really as a friend on my first record because I wasn't sure that I knew what I was doing in a record studio on my own you know uh, and he just sat around and said well that sounds like a good stereo balance to me and why don't you add a bit more of this and a bit more of that that was what Robin did on the first album on a second album I just uh, did it on my own with shouted comments from the back of the room from the rest of the band this is one subject about Gong that you were involved with Mm. were you involved with David Allen's Gong or was it Pierre Morlin's Gong Well, the two, of course, are, are grossly different. They sure Pierre are. Merlin's gong has got nothing to do with anything that was really called gong in the first place. No, David Allen was there when I was there. 
but he was becoming disillusioned with the whole thing anyway and, mm. and he re really resented me as being a professional musician he, d he doesn't like professionals mm -hmm. and people who play and you know people who, who know what day of the week it is and that kind of thing you know and I, I, he's, he's totally opposite from me you know he wanted to keep this happy-go-lucky shambolic hippie thing happening you know and I'm not that keen on that particular approach I was just doing it as a deputy for a while you know as a what we call a deputy the, the drummer had been forbidden entry into or been kicked out of France for imbibing of various chemical substances you know the French government has a kind of fit and kind of says well you can't ever return to France again my dear sort of thing you know <laughs> like the French do and so I was flown out there just to finish a tour and go to Norway with them just a while I mean it was just a small session I liked the band, I thought they were really good at that time. They've changed drastically since then. Yeah, there is a certain uh, really sort of slightly immoral way that these groups, I mean really Soft Machine should no longer be called Soft Machine, mm. I don't think Gong should any longer be called Gong. I'm glad King Crimson stopped when it did stop because at least the name when it stopped did mean something, it was preserved as something. Obviously it could have continued without Robert Fripp and we could have had A and other on guitar and this thing called King Crimson would continue, but of course, you know, you lose the initial spirit. I mean, there isn't one of the single Doobie Brothers in the Doobie Brothers anymore, I'm told. And of course, the name is kept going for commercial reasons, which doesn't sound like, sounds like a little bit like Trades Description Act to me. I think really the, the, the essence should be there if you're going to continue with the group name. So Gong is now a totally um, Pierre Merlin's group and nothing to do with anything called Gong. Mm hmm. So you've had no real association with David Allen since then? No, no, I haven't. No, no, I've not spoken to him. I'm kind of jumping around a bit here. Mm -hmm, it's all right. But on the King Crimson situation, I'm just curious, what was your your view on King Crimson when they did break up? Um, well, I'm kind of a loyalist. I get involved in bands very much, you know, and I get emotionally fraught, emotionally and very involved with the thing. Um, great shame to see it stop. It, it, it seemed for me, I mean, we just delivered a great concert in Central Park in New York to 7,000 people, and we were beginning to get somewhere. I mean, the band was within spitting distance of the top of the chart, you know, we were like 50 in the chart or somewhere. And naturally, it could have been followed through to become a big group, I'm pretty sure of that. And I thought it was pretty adventurous music for the time. Hell, we were, we were, we were improvising a lot of music there. It was, it was adventurous. It was good. Um, so I could have used it to continue. But given the fact that its mainstay didn't want to, then, I mean, that's a fact of life. You can't, there's no point in crying over spilt milk. I mean, if the thing can't continue, it can't continue. You can't twist people's arms. I mean, I almost twisted Alan Holdsworth's arm to come round America again for a second time last year. And I regret it, actually. I exerted pressure on him to do it. Because he was unhappy immediately with Eddie and John and should never have got involved in the first place. But really, it's a dangerous game. I've, I've, in my past, I've made musicians do things I, I wanted them to do, kind of against their will, and I don't think I do that again ever more. It never works out. You know? mm -hmm. One group that you were involved with as a session group was Absolute Elsewhere. Oh. Now. Well, as a group, I mean, uh, I understand they're putting my name on the front of that that album. There's a, there's a sticker or something with my name on the front. I've seen that featuring yeah. Bill Bruford, which is really disgraceful, actually. I mean, that's also almost illegal. I think I'll have to set somebody onto the case there. Wasn't there a man? There was no group Fishman? there. There was a man called Fishman who's a young lad whose father owns a recording studio and he has far too much money anyway. I was. You know, there's an understanding when you're doing studio music, music that it's anonymous. You know, I mean, if you do a dog food commercial, you don't really put featuring Jeff Berlin at the top of it, you know, because the musicians do it anonymously. That's the whole point of it. It's in fact all a fallacy, really. I mean, it's a crazy world and anonymous music. That album was, was the result of uh, two hours listening and one or two hours playing one afternoon. You know, it was um, neither here nor there. I was paid about $100 for it. Oh, really? Mm hmm. That's all it was. It was no group. It was, you should not run away with the idea that we'd formed any group. I was merely rung up because I was available for studio work to do some work. So I turn up with my drum kit, I listen for an hour and I play for two hours and I go away with a hundred dollar check. That's called anonymous studio music. You mm -hmm. understand? So the next thing you know is three years later the thing's got with, featuring Bill Bruford sticker on it in America, which is not, not really um, permissible. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely elsewhere is nothing at all. Rubbish. If I could afford a lawyer, I'd put him onto one. <laughs> put him onto that. <laughs> okay. How do you f presently feel about just 
you know, the music scene <laughs> and everything, just in, in general, how do you feel, like, you know, about Bruford lasting? Well, I'm going to continue. Yeah. I know that. So there's certainly a group going to be uh, called Bruford that's going to continue. Mm -hmm. That's another absolute fact. I mean, obviously, I'm not about to join Genesis now, am I? Or, um, you know, Jefferson Starship or something. I mean, I've obviously worked myself into this position. I spent a lot of sweat doing it because uh, it's obviously where I want to be. Now, I should financially it become just too much. And, I mean, I know Billy Cobham had a lot of problems financially, and it can happen. Uh, then I would swallow it. I just forget it, probably. If I do join Genesis or Jefferson Starship, you'll know it's become financially intolerable, <laughs> because obviously it costs a lot of money. All things being equal, I'm hoping that we can break even, which I'm sure we can do in a couple of years. Mm -hmm. I have every reason to believe that that uh, I'll be able to keep going. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm I'm only too 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 pleased that I've got a group. I think it's great, and uh, it's really fun. And I think I think musicians can take too much notice of what record company people say that you've got to have a platinum hit album in mm -hmm. two weeks or else you're off the label that kind of general approach I think there's enough Americans who understand that, that novelty isn't everything you know that it doesn't have to be instant this instant that necessarily brand new that uh, you can wait a little while for something to mature even that's not a bad idea I think there's enough people around who understand that to support me probably in this kind of thing. If I'm proved wrong, well, I'll just have to swallow it. It's an indulgence running your own band that ultimately has to kind of pay off, which is why I'm explaining it to you and why I'm going to go and play two shows at the Agora and it's running your own band that ultimately has to kind of pay off, which is why I'm explaining it to you and why I'm going to go and play two shows at the Agora and, you know, we're on a long tour. You seem to be pretty knowledgeable of the whole record company business situation. Well, if you're spending your money, you'd be an idiot to be otherwise. Right. Oh, well, it's, it's really very, people are very transparent. Most record company people, you can see through them like paper, mm -hmm. you know, like translucent paper. I mean, it's... it's it, it's very simple. America is a very simple country. You know, you have a dollar and you invest it and you try and make two dollars. It's very simple. If you don't succeed doing two dollars, you usually get fired from your job. It's very easy. I mean, that's the, one of the attractions of America. There's nothing complex about it at all. You're either making money or you ain't. If you don't, you're out, which is the commercial way. I mean, in, in England and uh, mixed economies, I mean, it's all far more complicated than that in many ways, which is why America is attractive and easy. That's its it's it's attraction and also the loathsome thing about it it is both it's that's parado paradoxical it's attractive and repulsive at the same time it's almost a hypnotic state it's almost right? a hypnotic state but america was was really good to my kind of music in the early 70s when things were flourishing so i don't see why i should just pack up and run away the minute things get a bit tougher in the in the late 70s because sure enough in the middle 80s they'll open up again probably it might be a different form it might be something to do with video cassettes or um, something I'm not very up on the technical technological front but uh, I have a feeling I'll be around I think that's the, the important kind of thing to, I mean I don't do anything else there's nothing else I can do really I am a sort of musician and more of a jazz musician than a rock musician don't call me jazz what are you trying to do cut my head off <laughs> oh, don't call me jazz please we'll keep that word out of this conversation okay you call me jazz and Polydor immediately will cut their minuscule budget to me by 25% about 50% and I can't even afford to pay the air tickets over here. No, this is a rock group. Let's get that straight. Because I noticed on your first album that you said Dave Holland is one of your idols and you would be interested in playing with him. Has there anything come about from that? No. No, no that was all, again, a slightly silly story that's probable Richard Williams should not have put on the album, Steve. In fact, no, I was just talking to Annette. Let's get this straight, this little story. It's all very boring, I'm afraid. Hold on, listeners. This is a really tedious story. But I was just talking to Annette Peacock. I said, would you sing on my record? She said, fine, I'd love to. Have you got a bass player? I said, as it happens, yes, I've got Jeff Berlin. He's coming from America. I said, oh, that's funny. You could have... I said, well, that's fine, but you could have used Dave Holland, who's uh, who's who's a friend of mine in, in, in London right now. I said, no thanks, Annette, because Dave Holland doesn't play the kind of music that I intend to play on this record. So that was how that silly story kind of came about. 
Dave Holland's a great musician, but totally unsuitable for this group. Mm-hmm. You seem to have more of a driving type of a, a drum work rather than a, a very subtle drum work. That's correct. That's correct. That's correct. It's more, um, it's more open, more driving, more straight ahead generally. Mm-hmm. And now, what about Annette Peacock? Is she going to be future on albums? Well, or? Annette has her own career, you see. I don't know. I mean, I like vocals anyway. I like what she did a lot. I mm-hmm. thought that was great. For some peculiar irony, one of a kind didn't have any vocals on it. I don't quite know why not. The tunes just didn't seem to need vocals at the time. No conscious decision. I think we'd probably have singing on the next record. I'm hoping that Jeff Berlin will sing. In fact, he's a good singer. And we're just running through some ideas now, actually, in rehearsals and sound checks with Jeff singing. Um, I'm a big fan of singers, but I think I wanted to use the singing in a pretty different way to the kind of thing that I've been doing before, you know, hence Annette Peacock. I wanted to establish as much difference in direction between Feels Good to Me and all the, the long winded Yes, Genesis, Crimson. ELP type of stuff that we'd had up to there. I was trying to separate myself, and I'm still trying to separate myself from that. You know, I'm not particularly interested in looking back to the 1970s, which is what UK wanted to do. I, I, there's six months to go to 1980, as I said already, and you know, we should be looking forward. And there's different things you can do apart from what has been done already. And that's what musicians are supposed. That's what they're paid to do. You know, looking back is a fool's game. Of the groups that you were with, which one do you think has influenced you the most? Well, so uh, groups, uh, more individuals. I mean, all, I try to be with strong individuals for everything I've done, really. I mean, there's not much to choose between Roy Harper, John Anderson, David Allen, Robert Fripp, Jamie Muir, perhaps. I'd say those are the strongest out of the groups that I've been with. They're all strong men, all with, all with very clear understanding of what it is they want to do, really, and nothing's going to stop them. And I am impressed by that, and I can respond to that, even if I don't terribly care for it. I can, I, can res- I can understand that, you know, and that's precisely the position I'm in. I understand what it, what it is that I, want to do, or that I want to do, and I really see no reason why now that anything should, you know, particularly hold it up. There's a minor recession going on in America, but, <laughs> but, um, or a major recession. Yes, let's say major. But, and acute paranoia throughout the, the record industry. Um, but I, I'm a long-term stayer. Mm-hmm. You know? Is there any possibility of you getting together with Robert Fripp? Well, none at all, I should no. think. No, Robert has his own career now that he's operating, you know, which is economical. Mm-hmm. One suitcase, one guitar, one tape, one tape machine. Mm-hmm. And he's not about to carry a band. You'll notice a lot of people aren't interested in bands anymore. Mm-hmm. Bands are expensive, a lot of problems with bands. Uh, but I happen to like playing with other musicians. I couldn't possibly play to a tape recorder for 50 cities. You know, that would drive me absolutely insane. I prefer music to me is the interaction of people. That's what, and the cooperation of people. And the degree to which they cooperate is the extent, is the success of the uh, evening's music. If they cooperate well, it's great. If they don't, it's poor. Mm-hmm. That's what music is to me. So uh, any talk of uh, me going around record shops with a rebox and a guitar or a snare drum, in my case, would be absurd. I get the feeling that the business end of the music business has uh, spoiled you, uh, spoiled your artistic creativity. Just just from listening to the conversation, it's been like real heavy business. And uh, how do you feel? Well, I don't know what you call that real heavy business, my friend. But when you're losing money like left, right, and center, you're probably going to question what it is that you do. I mean, I don't know. Have you ever invested in anything that you've done? Well, you know, sure, yeah. we'll get out a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand bucks, and put it on the table, okay. and and let's see if you're so sure that what you do is exactly right, because that's what we're talking about. I mean, it's all very well standing around saying, well, you know, um, musical creativity and shit. I'm a musically creative person. I don't, I don't. I'm aware of the business side of things precisely so I can retain musical creativity. It's imbeciles who are unaware of it, like Billy Cobham, who get themselves into deep trouble, and I have no intention of ending up in that particular position. That's why you keep your eyes open, you speak to the president of the record company, you understand who is spending what, so that you can sit down at your piano in October and write exactly what it is that you want to write. That's why I talk about it like this. 
Time for sound check. Yes. Thank you, Bill.